Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 14 uh, as we continue the story of, of Jesus. It's, it's approaching fast. We're approaching the end of the Gospel of Mark as we've been walking through this story together. We're three weeks from Easter. Uh, I hope that you're planning on being here on Good Friday as we celebrate um, the cross of Christ uh, through the Lord's Supper and worship together and reflect on what that means for us. And then as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday on Easter Sunday coming up in three weeks, hope you're inviting families, friends, neighbors, co-workers, uh, reaching out to disconnected church members, uh, whoever they may be, uh, that, uh, that aren't as, as connected and involved. And we want to have a big time, a wonderful time, uh, worshiping the Lord together on Easter Sunday. So I hope you're making plans to join us and be here uh, for that. But this morning... Uh, we're going to see at the end of uh, chapter 14, a, a chapter that's got 72 verses, a very long chapter as Mark tells the story of, of Jesus. Uh, and we see somewhat of a, a court scene today. We see somewhat of a trial, uh, Jesus being uh, on trial and thinking about that. I can think back to uh, many of the uh, very high profile, popular uh, trials and, and courts that have been shown. I mean, they've got court TV on all the time. You can watch that kind of stuff. And um, uh, But growing up, I remember in, even in middle school, uh, in, in sixth grade, the O.J. Simpson trial, which I know was many, many years ago, and I know there's there's been many more famous trials, and, and as we watch them and the media reports on that and we get consumed uh, by that, we get a glimpse inside the courtroom as people take the stand, various people that are involved, and uh, there's confessions, and, and, and there's denials, but ultimately uh, we, we see sometimes justice being done, sometimes we believe injustice uh, being done, and uh, as, we, as we watch those, we see all the, 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 the tense, the, the emotion, uh, all that takes place in those type moments, and uh, also think about uh, that court scene. Uh, in the old movie, A Few Good Men, where Jack Nicholson is playing the colonel, uh, and the trial is taking place, and the tension is building, and the tension is building, and he's on the stand, and he's being pushed to tell the truth, and he's been pushed to tell the truth. If anybody's seen that movie or knows anything about that movie, you, you know that, that the, the apex of, of that scene is where he's had enough, and he just yells back at the prosecutor, you can't handle the truth. And I thought about that as I was thinking about this story today, as Jesus tells the truth. And really, they can't handle it. They don't know what to do. And Peter wrestles with the truth and how he's going to respond in a tense moment where he ultimately denies Jesus. But Jesus has just been arrested by the betrayal of Judas, one of his disciples. Now Jesus is in the hands of the men who've been trying to stop him from the beginning, who've been trying to take him down from the start. And so we'll begin reading in verse 53 of Mark chapter 14. It says, they led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes assembled. Peter followed him at a distance right into the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the servants warming himself by the fire. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could not find any. For many were giving false testimony against him, and the testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, stating, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. Yet their testimony didn't even agree on this. Then the high priest stood up before them all, and he questioned Jesus. Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest questioned him. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
And then the high priest tore his robes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him to deserving death. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, prophesy. The temple servants also took him and slapped him. A bit of an unnerving scene, a bit of a tense moment, to say the least. As Jesus is being questioned, as Jesus is being pushed, as Jesus is being challenged, as they try to trap him. And I've said this so many times through the Passion narrative, through this this last week of Christ's life. I've said it all the way through the story of Mark and the story of gospel. But, but, But I don't want you to forget that Jesus is in complete control. Jesus is in complete control. And I would say the same thing to you today, where we are in our lives and what we're experiencing in our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own families, in our own church, our own community, and our jobs, and that, that Jesus is in complete control. Now, you may have affirmed that last week. Life was good and things were well, and you had no problem believing and holding to the fact that that Jesus is in control, that God is in control. But maybe some things happened this week in your life. Maybe some some things turned upside down, some some, some torment, some trauma, some difficulty, some challenges, some setbacks in your life, some things that just really disturbed you and upset you and and challenged you. And maybe this week you're you're not as sure and you're less affirming and and you're wondering and questioning some things in, in your life. But I I want to assure you that Jesus is in control. Jesus was in control then. Jesus is in control now. And Jesus will be in control tomorrow. And everything about this scene is suspect. But the one thing that's not suspect is that the divine will of God is being fulfilled. That Jesus is in complete control. And he's allowing what happens to happen for God's glory and for his purpose. Now, this wasn't the way that the justice system worked. But this is the way the ones who wanted to get rid of him worked. Now, all kinds of rules are being broken in, in, this, in this back room operation, in this sort of secret society. If they've arrested Jesus and it's the, the middle of the night and they've gathered all the, the cronies together and, and now's the time for them to take him down. Now is their opportunity. This is the chance. They didn't have much time. And obviously they didn't have much evidence. You see, the goal was to, to get this done because uh, according to the law, a trial couldn't happen on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is coming, so they need to, they need to, to prosecute Jesus, and, and neither could execution of criminals uh, happen uh, on the Sabbath. So not only did they have to, to convict Jesus, that they had to crucify Jesus before the Sabbath. And, and the goal was to, to get it done as soon as possible. Trials weren't supposed to happen at night. Charges such as blasphemy, which is what they charged him with, needed further substantiation and took, a, took another hearing on another day at the next level. And so I could go on and on and on and on about this shady operation that's taking place. But to them, none of that mattered. The rules didn't matter. The, the process didn't matter. The only thing that mattered to them was to do whatever they could to convict Jesus so they could crucify Jesus. And these are the ones who are anointed. These are the religious leaders, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, those who led worship in the temple, the religious leaders of society, the the anointed ones, the ones that were set apart to lead God's people spiritually are the very ones on bent on doing whatever it takes to take Jesus down. Jesus is a threat to their religion, and Jesus is a threat to their power. And he's been guilty in their eyes from the beginning. They aren't seeking truth. They're setting a trap. Fabricated stories are told in an attempt to to get proof, but but, but this crew couldn't even uh, coordinate. They they couldn't even corroborate their stories together to, to get enough evidence to, to get it done. You would think if they were so desperate to take down Jesus with all of these secret meetings and all the times that they met, surely they could get at least two or three guys to memorize the right story, right? 
uh, but, but these guys in this, in this crooked operation could, couldn't, even, couldn't even figure it out. And so the high priest decides to take matters into his own hands. He asks Jesus if these accusations are true. It, Jesus answers if what these men are saying is true about you. Th- then tell us. And Jesus is silent. Jesus doesn't answer. Isaiah 53, 7, as it describes the prophecy of the suffering servant, says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. As wicked and as sinister as all this was, the plan was coming together. All the pieces of the prophecy are being fulfilled. The time has come for Jesus to do what he came to earth to do. You see, Jesus is unique. Jesus is unlike any other. Jesus is set apart Ultimately, this confession that was used against him to crucify him. Again, the high priest questions him. The the high priest questions him and challenges him. Are are all these falsehoods and these things these people are saying about you true? And Jesus doesn't answer. Verse 63, again, the high priest questioned him. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, there's a beautiful irony here. Jesus' prosecutor, one who doesn't believe him, the one who wants to kill him, actually confesses who Jesus really is in the question that he asks him. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? This is who Jesus is. This is why Jesus came. And yet the prosecutor is the one who gets it right. He's the one who really proclaims who Jesus is. And all Jesus has to say in response is, I am. The high priest himself gives this full Christological confession. He proclaims the fullness of who Jesus is and why he came, and Jesus simply affirms it. And trying to trap him, he actually makes the most pure and profound statement about Jesus that we see in the story. Jesus was challenged to say, are all these false things about you true? And he was silent. But when the high priest proclaimed who he really was, Jesus spoke up and said, I am. See, there's a time to be silent. and There's a time to speak. After responding first with silence to the false claims about him, Jesus responds the second time affirming himself as the Messiah. Jesus was silent in response to the, to the false accusations against him. But when the high priest correctly identified him as the Messiah, Jesus spoke a word of affirmation to the claim. We, we can go all the way back to the beginning of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is how Mark begins the story, how he begins telling the story of Jesus and the message of the gospel. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's story began with this thesis statement. The gospel of Jesus, the son of God. He set the tone for proving who Jesus is. The son of the blessed one. Blessed one is God for the son of God. And this affirmation of Jesus being the son of God sets the tone for the forthcoming crucifixion and resurrection. And Christ's crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus would validate the words of this high priest 
would confirm his confession before the Sanhedrin. And this, this confession is the linchpin that got Jesus killed. But this confession and this truth is the linchpin that brought eternal salvation from God to the world. No one could claim to be who Jesus Christ himself claimed to be. Because no one could do what Jesus Christ himself did as he died for the sins of the world. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Messiah. There's only one Savior. And now here in this, in this middle of the night, sketchy scene, the secret's out. Jesus has confirmed it to be true. The cat's out of the bag. Jesus has finally declared himself to be the Messiah. Why would you put a cat in a bag anyway? I've never understood that exactly. I guess, I mean, you put a cat in a bag, they're not going to like it. You get them, I guess when they finally get out of the bag, they come out with a vengeance and it's like, Rah! I don't know because I don't have a cat because I don't need another boss. I've already got plenty of bosses in my life. But, but the cat's out of the bag. The secret's out. Jesus has now publicly proclaimed himself to be God, to be divine, to have power from on high, and he promises that he will one day be seated at the right hand of the throne of God, ruling over all. You see, Jesus is not only the suffering servant. He's more than just the Messiah who comes from the lineage of David. He's going to rule at the right hand of God. He's going to come again with power and authority like none have ever seen. And with this confession, Jesus has incriminated himself in the minds of those who are in charge. He's confessed. He's proclaimed. And before they march Jesus off to hopefully have him condemned before Pilate, they blindfold him and make a mockery of him. They spit on him, start slapping him around a little bit and sarcastically taunting him to, to, to see who was, who was slapping him. They blindfold him and they strike him and they spit on him. Well, if you really are God and the Messiah, then, then, then tell us who it was. A not-so-nice game of blind man's bluff. A game I've never played, by the way. A game I don't really understand. A, kind of a twisted game, you would think. You blindfold somebody, and then people circle around you, and somebody hits them, and you've got to guess who it was that hit you. Now, on, on, on some days, in a week moments, I, I'll confess might be a fun little game to take my frustrations out as long as I'm not the one who's blindfolded. And you could probably all think of a few people you'd want to play that game with as long as you could choose the person who was blindfolded. But they made a mockery of him. They spit on him and they ridiculed him and they shamed him. And so it begins. The most gruesome and horrific day in all of human history. Yet, it's good and meaningful for us because Jesus took our place. He took the mockery that we deserve. He bore the shame that belongs to us. And telling the truth in that moment, Jesus knew what it would cost him, and he was willing to pay the price. All the while Jesus is calmly confessing, Peter at the same time is dramatically denying Jesus. Let's pick up the story and continue in verse 66. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's maidservants came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it. I 
don't know or understand what you're talking about. Then he went out to the entryway, and a rooster crowed. When the maidservant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, this man's one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, you, you certainly are one of them, since you're also a Galilean. And then he began to curse and swear, I don't know this man that you're, you're talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Jesus predicted that Judas would betray him. Jesus predicted that the disciples would scatter, and Jesus predicted that Peter would deny him. And all of these come true as Jesus marches toward his death. A bold confession by Jesus is simultaneously coupled with a cowardly denial by Peter. And Mark sandwiches this scene of Jesus on trial with Peter standing nearby in the court bar. Because you go back to the, the, the first few verses that, that we read. And it began by talking about Peter standing in the courtyard. And then the scene changes to Jesus in the upper room. And the high priest's room up above. And Peter in the courtyard below. And then Peter, Mark circles back around. And lets us know at the same time that Jesus is confessing. Peter is denying. And after fleeing, remember Garden of Gethsemane, they're praying together, Jesus is arrested, and all the disciples fled, just as Jesus had said that they would. It seems that Peter's quickly returned. And he wants to be close to Jesus, and he wants to be close to, to, to where Jesus is. And, and he's in the, in the courtyard below, and, and clearly he sticks out like a sore thumb because he's a, a Galilean in the courtyard of the Jewish high priest. And, and it seems as though, though Peter wasn't quite ready to publicly confess Jesus. But he didn't want to abandon him either. And it's interesting to me, it doesn't seem to really be this angry Tense confrontation. But clearly Peter felt threatened for his safety as he was asked not once, not twice, but three times if he was connected to Jesus. And each time Peter denies it, the denials go stronger and stronger and they get more and more intense. Three times Peter failed to pray and be alert in the Garden of Gethsemane. And three times here Peter failed to confess his allegiance to Jesus. Verse 70, he was asked and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she asked him again. In verse 70, he says, but again, he denied it. But again, he denied it. This wasn't just a, a slip of the tongue. Translating that, again, he denied it. He kept on denying it over and over and over again. So it wasn't just like, oops, that denial slipped out. He continuously is denying that he knows Jesus or that he's associated with Jesus. It wasn't a slip of the tongue. He kept on denying Gentle pressure causes Peter, the rock, to crack. Now, we can look back in the story of Mark and the story of Jesus that Mark tells us to one of Peter's brighter moments as he boldly proclaimed Jesus as Messiah. Mark chapter 8, verse 29, we go back and people are trying to figure out who Jesus is. And some say he's a prophet and some say he's this. And, and, and Jesus says in verse 29, but you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you're the Messiah. Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And following this, just a few verses later in verse 38, Jesus gives a strong call to following Jesus. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father and the holy angels. Jesus didn't mince words about those who deny Matthew records in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. 
But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Jesus, Peter himself uh, earlier made a bold confession of Jesus being the Messiah. And Jesus follows that up with a stern warning. Anybody who truly follows me won't be ashamed of me. Anybody who's willing to confess me, I'll confess them to the Father. But anybody who denies me, I'll deny them before the Father. I can only imagine when that rooster crowed the second time. All this is playing back in the heart and the mind of Peter. You see, Jesus was in the process of dying for Peter while Peter was in the process of denying Jesus. And the catastrophic nature of this denial is difficult for us to understand. But when the rooster crowed a second time, we see the heartbreak in Peter. Verse 72, immediately a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter wanted so badly to stand for his Jesus. I believe that's why he came back. I believe his heart was to be allegiant to Jesus, to, to follow Jesus and, and to be there. That was, his, that was his Lord, his master, his friend. He wanted to defend him and he cut the ear off of the, the guard and, and then he ran away and fled, but he, but he came back. And he wanted so badly to stand for his Jesus, but instead he fell in denial. And the guilt and the shame overwhelmed him. The tears of remorse consumed him with a broken heart. Now, thankfully, we'll see later how the resurrection of Jesus brings redemption to Peter as Jesus restores him. John, John records this in John 21 of his beautiful gospel account of how Jesus restores him with three questions and three affirmations coinciding with the three denials of Peter here. But what we see in this scene, what we see in this story is that, in essence, Peter and Jesus were both on trial. Peter failed at his, but Jesus triumphed in his. And as we compare these two scenes, we can see the chaos in Peter and we can see the calm in Jesus. Peter loses his integrity to save himself. Jesus keeps his integrity to sacrifice himself. The contrast of Jesus and, and Peter here is crystal clear. Peter was guilty and Jesus was innocent. Peter was weak. Jesus is strong. Peter was faithless. And Jesus is faithful. Peter sought to save himself, but Jesus sought to sacrifice himself. And here's where it all went wrong for Peter. Peter trusted in himself more than he trusted in Jesus. Peter trusted in himself more than he trusted in Jesus. Peter's story of denial is a warning signal to all followers of Jesus who are not spiritually prepared to stand for Christ and face persecution. In Gethsemane, just before this, Jesus instructed them to do what? To watch and to pray, to be alert and to be prepared and to be strengthened. And Peter, like the rest, weren't spiritually prepared through prayer. Jesus was spiritually prepared through prayer. The calmness of Jesus 
is seen as his connectedness to God. The chaos in Peter displays his disconnectedness from God. The calmness of Jesus shows his full and utter dependence and submission to the will and the purpose of God. But the chaos of Peter shows us the wrestling and the struggling and the fighting to trust in himself and anybody else he can, to save himself, to rescue himself. And I believe that Peter wanted to stand for Jesus. I believe that Peter wanted to be loyal and faithful to Christ. But human willpower isn't powerful enough on its own. Human willpower is not powerful enough on its own. Our intentions and our desires to do good aren't good enough on their own. Our intentions and our desire to follow God's will and to submit to God's will under any circumstances aren't strong enough on their own. Peter was determined not to deny Jesus, yet he did. Peter swore his loyalty to Jesus, but he cracked under pressure. In the story, we see the confession of Jesus. We see the denials of Peter. And we see the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our strength. And Jesus is our example. And Jesus endured injustice. And he remained faithful to God's will. And you and I can too. When our faith is firmly in him. And when we're empowered by his spirit. And maybe we have the willpower and determination of Peter. That's not going to be enough. We need to be fully dependent, fully connected to God in prayer. Depending upon him. Relying upon him. And letting him infuse us with the power of his peace. So when it's time to stand and confess Jesus, we will. Let's pray. Father, what a dramatic scene to think of Jesus, our Savior, being falsely accused and wrongly charged. For doing nothing wrong. But God may give us gratitude to see that Jesus gave everything for us. He was willing to sacrifice his life for us. God, I pray in response to that, that our lives would be lived fully committed to him. Setting ourselves apart from the world. Not not, not cracking under the pressures of society, but standing firm for Christ in any and every way. But God, we know that that we can't do it on our own intentions. We can't do it on our own power, on our own strength, on our own determination. That God, we must fully submit ourselves to you. That we must stay fully connected to you in prayer, in the word, in worship, and in service. And Lord, we need confidence to know that the more closely we're connected to you, the better we'll be able to stand. Stand against the world. Stand against those who don't know Christ. And to bring glory and honor to our Savior, through our allegiance to Him. God, give us the strength that we need today to live well for You. To not deny You with our words or with our actions or even with our intentions but to be fully surrendered to you that we might be able to stand and proclaim you at any cost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I want to invite you to stand and sing this. We're going to sing one more song.